Hello and welcome. My name is Reinhard Partman and in this video we are going to talk about how can we design network and security components based on capacity and availability requirements. So when we talk about capacity and network requirements and availability, things like more than one node, cluster, redundancy, single point of failure come into mind, right? So all of these aspects need to go into a design. And when we look at the network and capacity design, we need to do some calculations, of course, and how are the network flows, how many connections do we have, how many components do we have, how can we spread the traffic. All of that matters. So let's start from the ground up at the end of the day. Because in a horizon environment, we always have a vCenter and ESXi hosts. So vCenter, we, we can protect with HA, fault tolerance, vCenter HA. So we can protect our components on this level. We have more than one ESXi host, hopefully. And then we can build up an ESXi host cluster. Then we have some features like HA, DRS, vMotion, fault tolerance. At our leverage. With HA we can prevent hardware failures so virtual machine will be started on a functioning host when one host where they were running on is physically failing. So what else do we have? We have storage. We have storage networks. They also come into play when we're talking about horizon network connections. Maybe not directly but indirectly because we need performance in this network, very high performance. Why do we need high performance? Because users want a snappy reaction on the desktop. They don't want to wait when they are saving files and stuff like that. So the storage network should be separated from your production network, should be separated from your vMotion and from your management network. So you have a lot of different networks there. And at the end of the day, you need high availability or availability, better to say, in all of that networks because you don't want to lose a feature in production or even in a corner case scenario when there is a failure. And when we talk availability on the network side, the production network also must come into play and all there is is more than one component, network switches, network routers, firewalls, load balancers. And we went to talk, when we talk availability, well, one single item won't cut it, right? So we need at least two, so that we can switch from one device to the second device, either which it, either it's an active-active or hot standby or active-passive whatever solution you can afford and are willing to pay depending on your availability and risk needs. This also goes into the design on a financial standpoint because the more numbers of nine you want to have, the more expensive it will get. So designing a network solution doesn't start at the virtual machine layer, it starts way before that. So, and when you add all those things up, you have a lot of components you need to take, put your finger on and say, how will my system behave if it fails? Will it switch over? What needs to be done so that it really switches over? What will the user experience in that case? And stuff like that come into play. On the next level, we go when we talk Horizon, what Horizon components do we have? We have our connection servers. I hope you have more than one. Again, the same goes for the UHEs, the Unified Access Gateway. Maybe you have still the security server when you have an older view environment. And you need to think about user sessions. Also, how are connections built up? I have provided a couple of links. We will go to them. How are the flows and stuff like that? So that we can look into all of those aspects. So let's start with the connection server first and then we go through each component and talk about a little bit about it. The connection server is basically the point where the user is pointing to and say, hello, here I am, please authenticate me. Well, the authentication will run through the back end to your Active Directory. Guess what? You should have also more than one Active Directory controller because they could also fail, right? So 
the Horizon Connection Server is usually um, located in your internal network with internal IP addresses, is also communicating with the vSphere infrastructure and can be easily made highly available with the feature vSphere HA. I wouldn't even go to more than that because if you have more than one, if it fails, it reboots, comes up, everything's fine. No, no issues there. It will be reachable through port 443 on the admin interface, port 4172 for PC over IP, and 2243 and some other ports when you're doing some other protocols. So, but at the end of the day, we can load balance those connections if we want to. And when I say, let's load balance it, okay, how? Cheap version, easy version, expensive version, good version, the good, the bad, the ugly. I don't know. I don't know your requirements. You need to read your business requirements. If you go through your business requirements, you will come up with an idea and then you will have a design. You will present the design. Maybe someone says, okay, I didn't tell you correctly what I really meant, stuff like that. And then they will come up with... Your approach is good, but it's a little bit too expensive. Something like that can happen, might happen, we don't know. So, we have round robin DNS. This is actually not very expensive because you just set up a secondary connection server. If you have the right Microsoft licensing in place, you just spin up a virtual machine. And what it actually does it, you have one name, but you get a different IP address back. So it's left, right, left, right, left, right from the connection server connection when a user is connecting. Easy to set up, low cost. But there are some disadvantages. The disadvantage of uh, round robin DNS simply is that let's assume you have two connection servers, connection server A is going down. The DNS server doesn't care about that. From the perspective of DNS, the server A is still there. It doesn't do any health checks if services or servers or IP addresses are still reachable on the network. And having that in mind, there will be then the situation that when a user is connecting, that a user will reach out to a connection server where no connection server is responding anymore. And again, you have an open ticket because the user experience is bad, right? So from that standpoint, you could use that but then you have to do some scripting in the back end so that those availability checks will be performed by your script and they then do some adjustments in your DNS. Again, providing those scripts costs time. They need to be tested and in that turn it will cost your company some money. Okay, so let's look at other options. We could use a network device called a load balancer. There are several vendors out there whose features we could use. We could use VMware NSX, for example, and other vendors. So what are the advantages of a network load balancer? We have a service awareness. So the load balancer is actively reaching out to my device or to my connection servers, in that case, better to say, and say, are you alive, A? Are you alive, B? Are you alive, C? Well. And then he's waiting for the response. If everyone is responding, yes, I'm okay, then he says, okay, I can load balance the connections between A, B, and Z. And he has some load balancing algorithm, so he can say, like, hey, I do it by a session, by the amount of network traffic, by the amount of packets, or whatever you want, or what is available to you in the feature set of the load balancer, right? So he needs to be able to load balance sessions for PCOIP, Blast, RDP, and stuff like that, and web traffic, right? Um, it protects against network attacks on the LAN and the WAN side because many of those load balancers have uh, security features already built in. They do service availability checks. We can do SSL offloading so that the SSL certificate checking and encryption stuff is not being done on our Horizon servers. We can offload this to our load balancer. They have specialized hardware in it. And the encryption is hard mathematical stuff. 
it really can make your CPUs, well, I wouldn't say burn, but they get hotter. And it's load on your ESXi hosts and load on your server environment. So you can offload these tasks to a more specialized hardware. And it's, well, if you have paid for it, why don't you use the feature, right? And having that said, we have a lot of fe other features on our load balancers there too. Here you see on the diagram, a user is connecting to whatever network connections we have, and the load balancer is fronting the connection server. So our client actually is talking to the load balancer, and the load balancer then decides you go to A, B, or Horizon connection server C, whatever the load balancing algorithm actually is configured to. Then your session will be forwarded to one of those connection servers, you will be authenticated and your session will be started. So this was an internal connection. Let's talk about an external connection. With external connections, we have our universal access gateway, most likely in the DM set or daisy chain, one in the DM set, one in the LAN and the user's session is being terminated there, still authenticated on the back-end connection server. So if you look at this diagram, at the end of the day, the user is connecting to a load balancer. That load balancer is fronting to the UAG nodes, and then the UAGs are again contacting and reaching out to the load balancer in front of our connection servers, if you want to build it out like that. So, like I said, you have a lot of options there. So let's switch over to, um, to, a, to the tech zone of VMware and I will show you a couple of things there and you will find a lot of additional information regarding network design and network and capaci capacity availability requirements for your Horizon environment. First of all, if we talk about those requirements and capacity requirements, availability and all that stuff which is surrounding this area. First thing which comes into mind are, well, maximums, right? So we have vSphere maximums, we have Horizon View maximums, we have a number of virtual machines, number of data stores, number of network cards, number of switches and stuff like that. Um, in vSphere, honestly, if you reach those limits, you have a very, very big environment. And companies I worked with, they said, oh, that's big enough, we will never reach that. In a couple of years ago, if you go back, let's say eight years, this was way easier to reach those maximums. Nowadays, you will be probably fine. So if you go on VMware's knowledge base article site, you will find Horizon 7 sizing limits and recommendations. And there you find a tabular version of the numbers and figures, what, what are the maximums. For example, we have now user sessions. In version 7, we had 75,000 concurrent user sessions. In 7, 8 and later, they bumped the number to over 250,000 concurrent sessions. So that's actually very, very high, right? How many ports can you have? Now we have 50 ports in 7, 8 and up. So I won't go, to go through each and every number here, but this is for your reference. So. The knowledge base article number is 2150348. There you can find the maximums for Horizon. If you go on VMware's website, configmax.vmware.com, you will find for a lot of products, vSphere, NSX, NSXT, also configuration maximums. So what I selected is vSphere in version 6.7, and I uh, selected not all maximums, I went to virtual machine maximums. And there you can see what maximums per virtual machines are available to you. So again, within a VDI environment, you most likely will never reach those maximums too, but you sh still should know them because let's say you build a desktop pool, you have 800 virtual machines in your pool or in this network where your pool is residing and you only have 512 IP addresses, or 256. Well, you have 800 VMs, so you are a couple of IPs short. What will happen? Those machines will boot up, 
and they will fail. They will stuck in any state, either linked or instant clone, because they cannot reach out to their connection server, they cannot configure their network, they cannot pull their GPOs because they don't get an IP address, because your DHCP server ran out of IP addresses he could hand out. So this also goes into sizing and requirements and availability, because after 255 IP addresses, you ran out of IP addresses, and all the others, which are go up to 800, you can't use them. So availability out through the window. So let's talk about Horizon connections. How are they built up? You have seen a couple of slides. So again, this is on the tech zone. The tech zone is a very informative site regarding all uh, Workspace ONE and Horizon stuff. So we have primary and secondary sessions which are built up. The primary session is always the authentication session. The, ses the secondary then is the KMS, the keyboard mouse screen, so the interactive sessions. So primary protocol, this is the authentication, secondary, and those can include, and mostly this does include, the remote display session. So if you look at the screen right now, we have the Horizon client, the authentication is going through the uh, Horizon connection server, the connection server is reaching out to the backend, to the Active Directory, gets a validation, hopefully that the, your credentials are okay, comes back, brokers a session, brings back the agent IP and the client can then reach out to the Horizon agent and build up the remote desktop session. So if you scroll down a little bit, you we see this the whole same setup with a load balancer. So again, the client reaches out to the load balancer who fronts the connection servers, authentication is being done and then is going to the agent and makes up the protocol session for the graphical image. But that's not it. Again, we have our Horizon client, have our unified access gateway. The flow is basically the same, but now it's being terminated in the UAG. From the UAG goes the authentication session to the Horizon connection server back to it and um, to our Active Directory. If everything is okay from the UAG, we go then directly to our agent. And if you look now at the screen, we have also our UHEs fronted by a load balancer. And the UHEs are reaching out to the load balancer who is fronting our connection servers. And again, Availability is that we can have the service available to our users more or less 24-7, right? Um, capacity, on the other hand, is a complete different thing because let's say we have 500 users, maybe it will be fine. But if you have 500 task work, because you're still fine, then you put on the same setup 500 designers with 3D workload. Well, the connection flow, everything is still okay, availability is still okay, but hey, didn't we also talk about capacity? And when you do 3D, you have one thing which changes dramatically. The load on your network. Because when the designers are really hard working and are rendering and doing 3D stuff and 3D cards and everything goes fine. If they work through and have to work through a, ne a network bottleneck like WAN lines, internet connections and stuff like that, well, they will experience severe delays, high round, round trip times and
will they do? They will complain. They will open a ticket and say, hey, last week it was better. Oh, we forgot. We added 200 new users to it and didn't build up a, 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 and we didn't upgrade our internet line. So also keep that in your mind when you're designing solutions with Horizon and around Horizon, right? So what else do, you, do I have for you? We have scalability and availability. This is the whole topic of this video, actually. Again, on the tech zone, when you go to component design horizon architecture, you will find also um, maximums regarding to your connection servers, how many sessions are supported. So we recommend most of the time maximum 2,000 sessions per connection server. So then if you need more than 2,000 for even basic availability needs, you at least have two connection servers so that if one fails, you can still run on one. Well, then it's degraded, but somehow your system will still work. Users can connect, they can authenticate and can create new sessions. And during that time, you have time to repair your failed connection server, right? If you need more than one, just add connection servers to your Horizon connection server pool. You can add up to seven connection servers. And then you have around about 10,000 user sessions in one view block. If this is even not enough, then just build a new view block and replicate one view block, second, third, fourth, whatever you like, and grow your horizon environment until you reach 50 sites, 50 view blocks, something in the, in the, in the maximum, guys. So, like I said, 250,000 connections so i think you have a lot of headspace there to grow load balancing of connection servers we already talked about that also we had our um external access these are just different slides but they, we talk always about the same stuff it's about availability and that nothing fails and at the end of the day we are doing this not for ourselves we are doing this for our users our users it's the end user experience always the end user experience in horizon environments because if users complain uh, projects can fail and this is most likely not a technical issue in horizon designs it's either political or stuff like that or user experience or money yeah right but user experience is the key feature in Horizon design. Again, here we have a couple of strategies for our UG authentication, which protocols are we going to use. Here you have on this slide a side-by-side -side view, a load balancer fronting our connection server, a load balancer fronting the security servers in older environments. Maybe you have a customer with Horizon version 6 still running for whatever reason, right? And then I gave you here a link where you can deploy and configure the unified access gateway with high availability feature. And this high availability feature is not coming out of vSphere where we restart a virtual machine when a host fails. So no, this is actually a cluster feature within the UHE. So you have two UHEs, they are monitoring each other. If someone go, if one goes down, the other one takes the role, the primary role over. Um, you have automated installation with PowerShell, manual installation, videos which walk you actually through each and every step. And here on step seven is how this will work. And one thing you take into consideration is um, the high availability feature built in in the UAG is available since version 3.4 and upwards not in earlier versions. So you go on the UAG main administration site, which is reachable under HTTP colon slash slash IP address or full qualified name, domain name, colon port 9443 slash lowercase admin. You log on to your UAG appliance and then you configure the necessary uh, edge services there. Here you go to the edge services, unhide them, here we take the reverse proxy and then we are configuring the reverse proxy settings with all the necessary details for load balancing. And after that, we enable the 
HA version under Advanced Settings High Availability. You see still not configured. You click the gear icon there and from there then you can configure the group ID, the virtual IP address, stuff like that. Please do not forget it's HA. You need to configure this on both nodes, right? And after that the services in your virtual machine should turn green, so on the web interface should turn green, so that the services, the edge services up and running. Go, okay, so let's switch back to our slide deck. Again, like I said, display traffic, you can monitor your UAG on, on the monitoring page, you can do this via the API and stuff like that. And here we have a, a small calculation what what you will have and how is capacity and when does capacity drive your uh, design. Depending on the number of monitors, depending on the resolution, what applications are you working? Do you have 3D and are you using printing and stuff like that? Do you transfer data through your um, display protocol channels? All this goes into that calculation, right? So never forget that. Have your numbers right. And again, um, when this runs on vSphere, you have management traffic, HA traffic, vMotion traffic, storage traffic. This needs to go out of the host into your storage and your network. Um, it, let's say you are doing vMotion because a host needs to be patched. Well, let's assume you have a virtual machine which has 16 gigabytes. Well, I always do the example with 64 gigabytes with server, so let's stay with that. But then we have four VDIs, 16 gigabytes, it's the same, right? So 64 gigabytes, which need to be vMotioned over a one gigabit network link, because in our uh, example here, we have only one vMotion link and this has one gigabit. Well, if you do the math, over one gigabit, you can transfer 100 megabytes per second equals to 0 0.1 gigabytes per second. So it will take 640 seconds approximately to transfer 64 gigabytes from one ESXi host to the other over a one gigabyte link. At least this is the optimum value. This is around about 11 minutes. So if you have a host which has way more um, RAM like that, which is very likely, you can do the math how long it will take to evacuate a host. And on top of that, this is a very idealistic calculation because if you have dirty pages, stuff like that, retransmits and stuff like that, these numbers will go up. So again, crunch your numbers, have your numbers, do the math, analyze everything up front and then do your design right and then it will 